from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, thanks for coming back. Okay, we're going to have a really exciting panel this time, I think, because we're going to be talking about the types of uses. And I think we'll go around and say our names and what the organization we're with very briefly. I don't think you need to hear who we are anymore. The Copyright Office will start with you. Okay, great. Um, I'm Michael Carroll. I'm a full, my day job is a, a professor of law and director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property at American University. Um, I'm also on the board of uh, Creative Commons, Inc., which is a nonprofit uh, headquartered in California, and the public lead of Creative Commons USA, which is the US-specific country project of Creative Commons. And I'm here in my dual capacities as a scholar of copyright law who studied the ways in which we tailor the law for, uh, through statutory licenses or otherwise um, and sort of, I've published some guidelines about how and when that does and doesn't work and want to contribute that. And then Creative Commons USA um, has this particular interest in knowing when you need a license and when you don't because a lot of people get confused about that. I'm Leah Prescott, um, the Associate Law Librarian for Digital Initiatives and Special Collections at Georgetown Law Library. I'm Ann Collins Goodyear, President of the College Art Association. Uh, Jody Griffin from Public Knowledge. Krista Cox with the Association of Research Libraries. Nancy Copans, General Counsel, Ithaca, which has its JSTOR, Portico, and Ithaca SNR. Manuel Ress, Knowledge Ecology International. Mm -hmm. Oh, Dan Collier, Chief Legal Engineer, Durationator at Tulane University. Lisa Shaftel, National Advocacy Chair of Graphic Artists Guild. <laughs> Chuck Slocum, Writers Guild of America West. Alan Adler, General Counsel, Association of American Publishers. Kyle Courtney, uh, Copyright Advisor, Harvard University Libraries. Dan Cohen, Executive Director of the Digital Public Library of America. Right now we're going to talk about the commercial versus non-commercial uses. As everyone knows, in the prior legislation, it covered both commercial and non-commercial. In the time that's, that's passed, there have been other countries that have done other things, the EU has only limited their Orphan Works directive towards non-commercial uses, but the UK has expanded it. So I wanted to start off in, I guess, a very broad question before we get into the nitty-gritty of what is a non-commercial use, is what do people think about having this, having any Orphan Works solution be applicable to both commercial and non-commercial uses? And Ms. Cox? Uh, so from our perspective, it's very important to have any Orphan Works solution um, applied to both commercial and non-commercial because the distinction to, and from our perspective doesn't really make sense. It can become fuzzy really easily. Um, and there's also arguments that not-for-profit not uses are still commercial and vice versa. So I think actually defining non-commercial and commercial gets very, very tricky. Um, so we think that any legislation should apply equally. Um, that uh, any narrow carve-outs for, for certain types of, you know, commercial uses or non-commercial uses could, could reduce the value of, of any type of uh, um, that type of legislation. Um, one of the solutions that we think might be better than making a distinction between commercial and non-commercial is um, kind of taking a lesson from the, the fair use factors, in particular the fourth factor, which um, which looks at the effect on the potential market, and that might be a more appropriate um, way to look at it rather than trying to, to say that commercial uses are, are not applicable. Okay, Mr. Courtney, and then sure. um, I'd agree with a lot of what my colleague says. Uh, library digitization projects, which we talked about, you know, mass or collections or otherwise, are not initiated generally to be developed or sold as commercial products, generally. Um, but to stimulate new scholarship, new findings, getting the very part of what we talked about earlier, promoting the progress of science in the useful arts. That's why we do that. Digitization, mass, or collection specific is a form of leveraging technology that can resuscitate old materials, derive valuable new information, and this is clearly sits in the field of non-commercial. However, you know, we understand that commercialization may happen later as the market dictates. Um, and I would just echo that um, the first panel has mentioned there was the possibility of nonprofit 
libraries, et cetera, are kind of serving as a commercial front, maybe, to get stuff digitized and then introduce it to the market. And you know, we don't take that approach. Uh, we take a similar to approach to the fair use, where we already have in the tests a balancing in the first factor, actually, a commercial versus non-commercial. So I'd agree that while the initiation of these mass digitizations that are occurring at our libraries are non-commercial in nature, I, I don't think there would be an objection to having commercial uses, which may satisfy everyone at the table as well. Thank you. Ms. Shaftel, and then we'll go around the table that way. Lisa Shaftel, Graphic Artist Guild. I think that any professional illustrator, photographer, or graphic artist would have absolutely no problem explaining to you what commercial use is. This is how we earn our living. We create visual works and we license them to different users to use in different uses in different media. And the value of the work is determined by its use, what media it's being used in and for what purpose. And what has little use today may have a lot of use in the future. Uh, and our value in licensing is also um, determined on exclusive rights and licensing exclusive use to certain clients or certain users. Uh, no author or creator can compete with free work. And once copyrighted works, copyrighted images are allowed to be used in the marketplace for free as alleged orphans, it's going to result in a very quick accumulation of a large collection of images that are still protected by copyright that most likely have very living working and breathing illustrators, photographers, and graphic artists who aren't getting paid for the use of that work. And we can't compete with free work. Free erodes copyright protection, and it erodes the value of the works. Someone is taking something of value without paying for it. We're not asking for more. We're asking for enough. We're asking for enough to make a living, not to survive, but to make a living selling our work, creating and selling our work. Okay, I think Ms. Um, Ress was the first to raise her hand over there. Um, uh, we work for consumers and we are a consumer organization. Nevertheless, we, uh, we believe the distinction between commercial and non-commercial uses could be okay as long as if uh, uh, non-commercial uses has more liberal procedures and greater access, of course. Uh, we also believe that commercial uses need uh, a pass to access. In a, in a way, consumers, consumer groups too, um, believe that there needs to be a pass, a pass to access of more stuff that's over there, but legal access. So we, we rely on commercial, commercial publishing, whether it's for textbooks or for uh, all sort of uh, activities and uses I'm thinking, for example, of uh, YouTube, which is a commercial publisher, for example, that consumers love. So uh, consumers are always well served, uh, not always, but <laughs> very often well served by private interest. And we think it's important to find a, a path that would reconcile both commercial and non-commercial uses. Okay, um, Ms. Copens. Well, I think a lot of it is contingent on the use involved, too. Um, and um, I find myself really on both sides of, of this divide. I think, you know, maybe for preservation, there's value in a commercial entity undertaking preservation services. Access might be different, and there are different types of access. There's incidental access, there's large-scale access, there's um, access that's monetized. Sometimes it's monetized for the sustainability of a project that could be for a nonprofit, that could be a public good. Sometimes it's monetized for individual enrichment. Um, so I think these are some of the things we'd want to be considering taking into account the very real interests of the rights holders in wanting to make a livelihood. Okay, um, Ms. Goodyear, um, Mr. Carroll, then I'll go to Mr. Adler and then Mr. Slocum. Uh, the College Art Association believes that um, uh, uh, orphan works legislation should apply equally to the commercial and non-commercial sectors. And this has to do with the, really with the uh, uses that our members um, may wish to make of orphan works. Many of our members, uh, which include 
practicing artists, art historians, curators, um, art publishers operate in non-commercial sectors, but often their activities shade into commercial sectors as well. For example, practicing artists may seek to sell their work in galleries, um, and uh, scholars or curators may wish to publish with commercial presses. And for this reason, we think that it becomes extremely difficult to try to bifurcate uh, these categories um, of practice. So we advocate equal coverage for commercial and non-commercial uses of orphan works. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carroll? Yeah, I want to I, I agree and suggest that that framing of commercial versus non-commercial is unlikely to be productive for, for some of the reasons you're hearing. That, that one of the ways, if you're going to have a license, a license should pick up where fair use leaves off. And we can have disagreements about where that line is, but we should be talking about licensing uses beyond fair use and then ask the question, is there a problem that the market's not solving with respect to those uses? Um, because certainly, um, you know, just the act of digitization is reformatting, right? It's save as. It's no different from taking a WordStar file and turning it into a dot .doc and taking an analog file and turning it into a dot .doc. You're just reformatting the document. That doesn't need a license. That's a fair use. Text mining and doing computational research on that data, does not that's a fair use or doesn't exercise the exclusive rights because it's not even reproducing the working copies. But it's when you make it public that we have the fair use conversation. If you're now making it publicly accessible, for what purpose, to what audience, under what terms, and there's gonna be a fair use zone with respect certainly to the library and archives. And then we've heard that the commercial sector feels like they're likely not to qualify for a fair use, and so there might be a targeted zone in that space for some kind of legislative solution where the author or rights owner cannot be identified, where the use is clearly commercial, um, and, and, and therefore, we can't get a negotiated solution. That would be the place of market failure. That would be the place for legislation to, to find a fix. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Adler, and I'd like to add something on that and perhaps you guys can also respond to, is how do commercial enterprises use these orphan works? And how often does it come up for, for commercial enterprises? And how has that within, worked within the business models that you guys are involved in? Um, well, just to answer the first question before I answer your other one, I, I think we have to be very careful to avoid um, adopting these kind of uh, caricaturish notions about the public interest and, and what commercialism is about and that the two are somehow mutually exclusive. Uh, what we're talking about here uh, in, in its basic terms is the idea that there are many copyrighted works that society does not get the benefit from uh, because of these issues involved with whether or not permission needs to be obtained and whether or not there's somebody available who actually can provide the permission that is necessary. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are a wide spectrum of interests along what is considered the public interest, and that includes commercial use of these kind of works. Um, to answer your question, Katie, uh, for example, in the publishing industry, uh, where three quarters of the players are actually considered small businesses, they're not the, the Simon and & Schuster's and HarperCollins of the world. Um, in that business, uh, the way in which these, these works would be used is as largely embedded and incorporated works in the works that publishers produce for the market. Um, they may range from photographs and other images uh, to small works like poems. They may involve letters that people have written. Some of that material may have been published. Some of it may not have been published. But the point is, is that when you publish a book uh, on a subject, there are many times that there is uh, uh, the need to publish in, in, within that work other works in order to be able to fully cover the subject uh, and to be able to expose what those works significance is to the subject uh, that is addressed. Um, and for that reason, I think that, that uh, our interest uh, as the Association of American Publishers extends from the many nonprofit publishers uh, who are members of the organization right through the work of the commercial publishers because we are used to having to license the use of other people's works. The, the issue of, of uh, uh, orphan works is really just a question of whether or not ultimately someone is going to have to obtain a license or whether or not they don't have to use a license because they have followed a scheme uh, that is meant to address the situation where there is no one who can grant the license, at least no one who could be found. Mr. Slocum? Um, 
I, I think I, I agree that the distinction between commercial uses and non-commercial uses is going to be problematic. There's a, it's a very blurry line uh, between those two. And I would say the same thing about um, the references earlier to whether something was made with commercial intent or not. Something that was made uh, that may not have, you know, initially seemed like it had value, could have great value. Um, but another terminology point that, that comes up when um, I'm thinking about the variety of uses is the uh, terminology orphan works. It seems to me we're really talking about orphan rights with regard to certain works, because you can have works where certain rights have been orphaned, but other rights not. It's very common in our environment in uh, film and television in Hollywood that uh, the writer retains certain rights, particularly to an original work, uh, where uh, most of the rights are conveyed to the, to the producing company, but they retain the right to, for instance, a stage adaptation or uh, to write a novelization or whatever. And so while the, if the producer is, uh, is defunct, the writer may well still retain other rights that the producer may, uh, to the public, seem to, to own, but they don't. Um, so the split rights um, problem, uh, I think, will come up a lot. Uh, one instance um, is that, that I would point out is where uh, the right may not extend to just anyone in the public, but a writer often will sell a script to a producer uh, and if the producer goes out of business, uh, the writer has a right to retain, to reacquire the right to a script if it wasn't produced. And so if the producer doesn't exist, they can't reacquire the right. And so it may, it may be actually not the right to take a clip from the movie or whatever, but an unpublished, unproduced work, uh, there may be a rights holder who can't be made whole because the work is orphaned. Uh, and so they may have their rights that need that could be uh, solved by a, such a policy as an orphan work policy. And are there thoughts on how, and I, I know Mr. Adler talked about this, and I think you did too, Mr. Courtney, about how there's kind of an intertwined nature of having a commercial and non-commercial and the difficulty in kind of trying to parse those out. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about people and, and enterprises that may, you might think are really non-commercial, but depending on whatever the definition of commercial might be, might also have some sort of commercial aspect that once you start down this road, it might make it a little more difficult to disentangle everything. Um, Ms. Cox? Um, so, I mean, I definitely, I definitely think that the commercial and non-commercial is often, can be intertwined. Um, for example, Google as a commercial entity um, can make non-commercial uses for the benefit, for example, of persons who are blind to make accessible format copy works and are able to do so um, at a much faster rate than some nonprofit institutions can. Um, and, and the reverse is true too, and I think that, um, that some lessons can be taken from the patent perspective. And in the Mady v. Duke case, one of the concerns is that um, the, um, the, the plaintiff in that case argued that Duke even though it was a nonprofit institution, was in the business of education. And um, you know, I, that hasn't happened to my knowledge in the, in the copyright sector, but of course, you know, sometimes those, those distinctions do get very, very fuzzy, and, and um, I think that's, that's part of the difficulty. Um, and, and just aside from that, I think we have to recognize that, that as I mentioned earlier, um, the Association of Research Libraries doesn't really see a need for orphan works legislation because from the perspective of libraries, we, we're, we're quite happy with um, the recent fair use jurisprudence and we feel like fair use is working quite well for, for libraries. So in order to make, if you do have orphan works legislation, in order to make it effective, I think you really have to think about the commercial users um, if you're thinking about libraries as, as nonprofit institutions that can already avail itself um, and has successfully availed itself of, of fair use. Um, you have to think about how to make this legislation effective and not, and not just redundant. Um, and I think you do that by, by applying it also to commercial users. Mr. Cording and then Mr. Adler. Uh, so, to quote a lot of, we're quoting a lot of copyright's greatest hits today. Um, even Harper and Rowe has said, copyright is intended to increase and not impede the harvest of knowledge. So we're talking about, you know, let's go say we go through a library digitization project and we, we find some orphan works, we digitize them, we put them online. A scholar comes along, visits our collection or finds it online, and then 
suddenly wants to write an article about that, they write an article. Now where does the article end up? In the hands of a publisher who's a commercial entity. So here we have, maybe not entangled, but we have a, a, a kind of transformation from a non-commercial activity that turns and uses that work and may have to go into a publisher's hands. And then a lot of the times, as we know, uh, publishers will be like, well, where are the rights that you need to use these images, these works, these photographs, so we can publish this into a book and or a journal. Um, so I think that it's, I view it as not so much as tangled as a transformative kind of moment where nonprofit activities turn into commercialization activities. Uh, Mr. Adler, and then Ms. Cummings. Well, one might have hoped that some of these issues that we had spent a lot of time discussing when the uh, 2008 legislation was pending might have advanced a little bit, but I see this is one that really <laughs> has not. Um, we had discussed at that time, for example, the, the, the quandary of trying to deal with the idea of uh, nonprofit institutions like museums and art galleries that nevertheless have shops that sell what are essentially commercial, uh, very high quality commercial books of their exhibits. And they do so, of course, in competition with other publishers of similar types of works. And so there's a question of how you would consider uh, that situation when you're dealing with an entity that has a nonprofit tax status but is engaging in commercial activity. Uh, we also spent a lot of time discussing questions of whether or not uses of orphan works uh, should be treated differently in terms of whether or not, for example, on one end of the spectrum, it was somebody who takes an orphan work and uses it to create a new work of original expression, as opposed to whether or not a publisher would take an orphan work, something that has uh, sort of sunk into obscurity over the years, and reintroduced it to the reading public merely by republishing that work without any alteration in, in its, its content. Uh, both of those things have great merit if you consider what the basic premise, as I said before, is of orphan works. The idea that these are works that are not benefiting society right now because people are concerned about whether or not they have the right and ability without running into the potential for facing infringement liability to go ahead and make those works available. So I would hope that if we're going to consider um, the merits of, of uh, orphan works legislation, we would consider them in terms of the broadest array of possible activities that make works available to the public that previously were not available to the public because of the inherent problem of orphan works. Because that's really the benefit that I think uh, is maybe the one area we all agree could come from orphan works treatment, that works previously not available to the public now can be made available to the public in a variety of different ways. And I would just uh, interject there, and then maybe there might be some people who would want to respond to this directly, but I know that this was an issue that was discussed. Um, and in the 2008 bill, they did have a provision in terms of kind of, um, you know, addressing um, whether reasonable compensation would be needed if it was a non-commercial um, activity and actually, right. you know, preventing even the re reasonable compensation in those particular And, and if you remember, we, we, we use the phrase that nobody likes, which is without any purpose of direct or indirect commercial advantage. And the reason nobody likes it is because nobody can agree on what it actually means in practice. Uh, but not to, to bring up something that no one likes, um, <laughs> the question would be, um, would a provision like that, that was in the 2008 um, legislation, um, address the, the various concerns that we've heard in terms of not actually creating a distinction between, um, an official distinction between commercial and non-commercial as to whether it's covered at all by the, by the, um, by the provision, but having a unique treatment under the provision um, for certain types of uses. So whether that proposal is one that we should continue to think of as a, a, a good proposal to, to, to think about in the future. So I think there's potential for confusion between the activities of a tax-exempt and non-exempt organization and between conduct that's undertaken for money or not, and sometimes exempt organizations charge money for certain things. There's just a private annulment issue there. So, um, so whatever gets decided or, or proposed, needs to address these kinds of things. And I can speak to you know, an organization, for example, that digitizes content. Um, some of it might be orphaned um, and charges a subscription fee for access. And that organization is a tax-exempt organization. There is no private inurement. The funds are for the sustainability of the project. But there is a fee-for-service business model. And um, 
I would worry that it, you know if commercial activity were excluded, um, that kind of activity could be, or at the very least, the definition of what is commercial activity should be um, carefully tailored to allow for projects that ensure the sustainability of, of, of these kinds of activities. Um, I also do want to add on that I think that you know part of the discussion here is um, you know a question I have is whether this is um, kind of an embellishment of fair use and adding kind of definition to fair use or steps beyond fair use. And that's sort of part of the story and that's something that Michael had raised at the other end of the table um, because you know there are there are instances where fair use might more clearly cover some of the activities. Mr. Carroll? Yeah, so I, I mean, the language I would recommend is rather than use this as an effort to uh, try to do anything to the scope of fair use, just agree that, agree that there's a disagreement about the edge, but the, the language could be very easy, right? Any use that exercises one of the rights enumerated in Section 106 that does not fall within the limitation of, the, of Section 107 dot, 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 right? Now we, we might disagree about exactly what that use is, but you've said it exercises an exclusive right and it's not fair use, and now we can talk about diligent search, we can talk about uh, whether it's com compensated or not, but, but you can leave that threshold showing to be litigated if necessary, but just say there are clearly going to be these uses that we will all agree are not fair uses, involving sort of commercial entities making, selling a, a work. And as, as Alan says that, but there's this, you know, this perfect piece to the puzzle of this new work that's an orphan, that you cannot find that copyright owner no matter how hard you look. And should we, the public be denied access to that piece of the puzzle? If that's the problem to be solved, setting up the threshold the way I just suggested leaves you the space to solve that problem without trying to do muddy the waters around fair use. I think um, I, I think it'll be uh, Ms. Griffin and then Mr. Slocum, but it also brings me back to something that we talked about in an earlier panel about the savings clause. And I don't know if anyone else had anything else to say about that. It was a little bit not exactly 100% supported in our other panel because some people were concerned about how it would interrelate. But if people have thoughts on that as well, that would be great. So I'll talk to Ms. Griffin and then Mr. Adler, or Mr. Adler and then Mr. Slocum. Um, well, what I was going to say is actually kind of similar to um, what Michael Carroll said, but I'll say it anyway, and I'll try to build on it. Um, the, the number, the types of uses, obviously, that you can make of an orphaned work are just as varied as the type of uses that you can make of any copyrighted work. Um, so we think that it's important to have an orphan work structure that allows for several non-exclusive approaches that run in parallel to each other and don't impinge on each other. So you could, for example, have a limitation um, on damages after a reasonably diligent search that doesn't, um, that doesn't supersede fair use and the robust, um, you know, the robust economy of creation that's built on the fair use doctrine. So um, I, I think it's important to consider the, the uses that, or the approaches that we could have in orphan works legislation that build on making more works available for subsequent uses, more creation, that doesn't uh, take away from what the public already has in the fair use doctrine. Okay, and Mr. Adler? Um, yeah, as, as I said this morning, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we shouldn't think that there's this, this dichotomy between, it's an either or choice between fair use and uh, having legislation that spells out a treatment of orphan works. Because uh, fair use is always there to, to deal with a situation where a use you would like to make of a work requires permission. And if you're not going to obtain that permission, if you're not going to even bother to try to obtain that permission, that's what fair use is there uh, for you to assert. Um, what we're talking about with orphan works, though, is a different situation. We're talking about a situation where uh, inherently you're dealing with a use that would require permission but for one reason or another, you're thinking that you don't want to assert fair use because if you're wrong about that, that leaves you fully exposed to all the remedies of the copyright owner if the copyright owner should emerge. So we're still talking about a situation that isn't addressed at all by fair use and, and needs to be addressed if there is going to be the ability to bring orphan works uh, to uh, the public generally. And that is the situation where 
uh, somebody wants to make sure because they can't risk uh, being subject to liability, they have the ability to use a procedure that largely avoids that liability. Now, when we talked about uh, the savings clause on fair use, there was some controversy about that, too. What, what I understood the savings clause to be important for was the idea that um, if, in fact, a copyright owner emerged, that shouldn't preclude the, the would-be user of that work from being able to assert fair use. A different question came up, what about the situation where somebody performed or claimed to perform a reasonably diligent good faith search, but in fact didn't? Should they then, when that is discovered, when uh, a court in reviewing the way they have conducted that search decides that that isn't a reasonably diligent search, should they then have recourse to a fair use defense? Some people would say yes, other people would say no. That's a policy decision that would have to be made, but that's also part of the notion of a savings clause. Almost like an unclean hands situation. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Slocum, and then Ms. Goodyear. Uh, let me just uh, agree with the distinction that in thinking about these uses, commercial, non-commercial, to me it's not relevant whether the entity is a not-for-profit entity. It's about the use and what use it takes away from the rightful you know, rights holders. Um, and you know, my members, quite frankly, are on both sides of this. They're, they're creators who have works that could be misused by, misappropriated by someone trying to assert an orphan right uh, that may or may not be, that may not be justified. On the other hand, there are also filmmakers who want to use clips or photographs or uh, audio um, in, a, in a film they might be making or might want to make a film of a book, for instance, uh, for whom they cannot find a, an owner or rights holder. Um, and so they might want to make use of orphan work uh, permission as well, um, as make sure their works are not unfairly treated under it. Um, but uh, um, so anyway, it's a, it's a, I don't know how the policy is ever going to be decided with all these different uses and all these different cases. It's, a, it's definitely a ridiculously complicated landscape. I guess unless we say everything. <laughs> Flexibility, it sounds like, uh, it was one of the, the themes that came across, at least so far, in terms of being able to address the complexity. I think um, it was Ms. Goodyear and then Ms. Cox. Absolutely. Um, Ann Goodyear for the College Art Association. There's no question that this is an extraordinarily complex question. And actually, I, I find myself, on behalf of CAA, um, agreeing with a lot of what has already been asserted uh, around the table. And I think one of the points um, that, that Nancy made, which is very important, is that many not-for-profit organizations avail themselves of commercial activities precisely in the interest of sustaining the not-for-profit mission. It's an, very often a vital income stream. And I think that's part of the reason that it becomes very tricky to try to parse apart um, commercial concerns versus non-commercial concerns in this context. And I think um, what a number of us are arguing around this table, and certainly CAA would want to add its voice to the chorus, is that our goal is to ensure that works that are perceived to be orphans are not cut off from public discourse simply because their right status cannot be adequately ascertained. And it's for that reason that CAA does not see um, orphan works legislation as being incompatible with our very strong interest in fair use. And in fact, we wouldn't want the two to be seen as being incompatible. However, if a fair use defense is not appropriate under a given circumstance or if it <coughs> fails, we do feel that it's important for um, orphan works legislation to provide some sort of safe harbor. And indeed, we would argue that not-for-profit organizations deserve really a complete safe harbor um, from uh, uh, um, liability for the use of orphan works. And this is not a desire to shirk our responsibility or to shirk um, uh, responsible licensing. It's simply to try to reduce the perceived risk and to put things into um, the uh, uh, arena of uh, creative interpretation, creative use that we feel do serve the, the greater public good. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cox, Mr. Cohen, and then Mr. Slocum. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to your question about <clears throat> the savings clause. And certainly, I think um, the savings clauses can be important. And um, I agree in a perfect world that there should not be um, it should not be an either-or choice between fair use and orphan works legislation, but from um, our perspective, one of our concerns is that 
Section 108 um, does very clearly have a savings clause, and some people have argued that the savings clause doesn't mean what the plain language says it means. As, as Jonathan pointed out this morning, they argue that 108 specifically enumerates certain spe uh, specific limitations and exceptions, and by with when libraries rely on fair use, they're swallowing up the exception, they're making this exception um, irrelevant, and so our concern is that um, even though we think a savings clause is very important, that, that you're going to run up against the same argument. So that's our concern with, um, with why we think the savings clause might not be completely adequate. Okay, um, and we have some more people. So that comment has generated some responses. I would say, I think, that that is an interesting point, especially if you are, depending on how risk averse your library is. So, for example, if you're a library who may not have the funds or the sovereign immunity to fight, to litigate an entire case, you might find some solace in having some more specified exceptions like 108. Mr. Gowen. Yes. So <laughs> Thanks. Um, I wanted to just um, agree with um, Ms. Goodyear and explain a little bit more, I think, about what's going on in her comments, which I think are really important from my perspective as well, running a large digital library that's for the public and that's open access. Um, I, I think that there's um, some things going on upstream that before we get to the question of whether something's going to be commercialized, it gets to questions of intent, particularly around scholarly use and student-based use. Um, there's often, and especially it does often revolve around orphan works where we're trying to make wider access or these, a lot of question marks, um, libraries, archives, museums don't quite know what they can do with the mass of materials that they have. Um, but they do have some kind of, if we want to call it pure intent at the start, which may down the road lead to questions of sustainability and where it's going to be published and these sorts of things. But they do go into an act which often is one of mass digitization, which might catch in a very large net a lot of orphan works where they are trying to enable certain kinds of uses that I think would normally fall under fair use or would be part of some kind of broader scholarly use that we want to we would want to extend the realm to include under some kind of legislation. So I think that's really critical, I think, to think upstream, and I noticed that the, even just the title of this panel is about users too and uses, and it's before it gets this question of how actually something ends up in the gift shop or just on a, in a scholarly monograph or just in a student paper, before it gets that point, there's a lot that happens just from a pure intent use standpoint that often involves these works, and that's where I think some more focus could happen before we get into what is admittedly, I think, a very thorny question about what commercial or non-commercial use is. Thank you. Mr. Slocum? Yeah, I think uh, I want to go back to the comment about nonprofit entities. I think it, any, kind of, any kind of blanket exemption or protection for nonprofit entities is, is far overbroad. It's, it must, surely must be related to certain types of uses being made by the nonprofit entities. I mean, you can't just have a library, because it's a library, be able to release a DVD of a Hollywood movie just because you can't find you know, who the producer was. So it, it, it's certain with respect to certain uses, perhaps. But I think it's really related to, as is the name of this, this panel, the uses, not who's using it for that purpose. And I think that was somewhat of the approach that was taken, actually, in the 2008 legislation. Mm -hmm. um, it covered libraries, but certainly uses um, the um, indirect or direct right. commercial advantage that no one liked, apparently. Uh, but if the panel has any specific um, suggestions in terms of trying to address that type of activity um, and, and define it in a way that people would be comfortable with, that would be a good um, information to have as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Adler, and then Ms. Goodyear, and then Ms. Griffin. Yeah, I think one of the things that, that, that I would say, uh, based on, on Mr. Slocum's comment and some of the other comments I've heard here uh, today, this morning and this afternoon, is that when we think of the larger context in which the Copyright Office is tackling this issue, we're now undergoing this larger comprehensive review of copyright. Um, you know, it, it is the case that with respect to the way libraries, educational institutions, archives are treated under copyright law, that to the extent we're talking about whether or not their privileges should be expanded or in other ways adjusted uh, for the digital age in order to accomplish uh, aims like the premise of uh, orphan works treatment, we may have to redefine what those institutions are. Uh, in this environment today, it's very difficult to say what kind of a library should receive certain types of privileges under the law. We've been dealing with uh, libraries traditionally, the notion of a brick and mortar library, which is a social center in a community and a place where people go to. Um, but we also now know that there are libraries that have no physical presence. They're completely virtual. 
and it's not very terribly difficult, apparently, to set yourself up as a library on a website. Uh, we see nonprofit educational institutions, for example, uh, you know, many of them, some of them that are, are members of the association, uh, are now sitting on, you know, multi-million dollar uh, funds that they have acquired through programs like the Buy Dole program that allows them to benefit from funding of research by the federal government. And then they, even though they're nonprofit institutions, are allowed to commercialize those inventions in order to be able to fulfill their obligations under that particular program. So I, I don't think we should all be certain that we know exactly what these institutions are today or what they could be, and we shouldn't make assumptions about an issue like orphan works or mass digitization or any other by simply assuming that because those labels meant something 25, 30, 40 years ago that they mean the same thing in the digital era today. Ms. Goodyear, and then Ms. Yeah, I would I would just note um, uh, that of course the Sean Bentley Act did indeed uh, contemplate uh, the uh, uh, granting of a safe harbor to not-for-profit entities, and actually CAA thinks that perhaps um, the scope of activities contemplated there may need to be expanded. For example, to include scholarly publishing. So that that question of the scope of activities would certainly be of interest to the College Art Association and something that we could consider um, expanding on um, in comments following this. Ms. Griffin? Um, I just wanted to point out, I think so far in this panel, we've talked a lot about education and scholarly uses by institutions, um, but there are also personal uses. Uh, and after all, at the end of the day, copyright law cares about people um, creating works and using works. Uh, so when we think about personal uses, some of them are, have sprung up on their own, and some of them are building on the tools and technology of institutions um, or, or for-profit companies that make collections available. Um, so I think that when we're looking at uh, the structure of or Orphan Works answers, we want to care about the uses by institutions that help their users. Um, but we also need to make sure that the solutions are usable by individuals who might not be as savvy as an institution like a university library. That's a good point, Ms. Griffin, and I wanted to actually expand on that, and then we can also talk to Ms. Shaftel, which is that there are a lot of individuals who might try, be trying to make uses of orphan works. We talked about the family photographs in an earlier panel and that kind of thing, and what do you do if you want to make a copy for your child or something like that, and the photographer is, you don't know who did it anymore, you don't remember. And so I wonder if we could talk a little bit about what, if orphan works, a legislative solution was to apply to all types of uses, would it be tailored in different ways to different types of users? And I'm not really just talking about non-commercial versus commercial versus nonprofit, more and more large company versus individual versus small business entity. And I'll turn to Ms. Sheftel, but also I'd really love to hear from everyone else about that as well. Uh, thank you. I, I wanted to address this notion of educational use and scholarly use. And certainly that's already permitted in fair use, as is preservation for archives. I'd like to point out that there are untold Americans who earn their living creating educational materials, whether they're written works, including photographs, illustrations, motion pictures, musical works. So any notion that anything for educational use should be allowed for fair use, that's ridiculous. You just, you've just wiped out an entire industry there and all of the creator's licensing opportunities for educational use. And we keep going back to the discussion of mass dis digitization of collections of libraries or archives. And again, a lot of this is permitted under fair use. And certainly, not every archive and not every library is entirely orphan works. There will be some in there, but not the vast majority. And I'd like us to remember the importance between keeping the issue of mass digitization of library collections and the non-commercial use or preservation of genuinely orphan works as two entirely separate issues. The cost and the time involved of locating and contacting rights holders who did not include license for digital use does not trump copyright law, nor does it necessitate allowing the use and digitization under an orphan works scheme. This is the cost of doing business. And I think that what most of the cultural nonprofits want to do in terms of preservation 
and their collections in out-of-print works and orphan, orphan works is already allowed under fair use. And certainly a rights holder would not object to, for example, a historical museum putting up a poster or a photograph on display in an, in an exhibit about an event. But once you take that photograph or that poster and you reproduce it and you're selling it in your gift shop, and I know you need to do this to pay your bills, you're not making your money from, from admissions at the door, but that is clearly a commercial use. And it's absolutely competing with the market interests of the rights holder, and it may actually be violating exclusive licensing contracts that that creator has with a client either in the past or present. And, and the user may have no way of knowing that. So just simply saying that you're a, a nonprofit, that's a tax status and a business model. That has absolutely nothing to do with how you want to use the work. Thank you. I think Ms. Cobans was next. Um, so much will depend on the remedies. That's a different topic. But these things work in conjunction. And I think and you, so, can, you can be, I, I'm moderating the one tomorrow. Yeah, so I'll see, see you tomorrow. Well. So, um, but I think that we can talk about um, that issue right now. Right. So different just, types of remedies for different type of uh, users. As a placeholder, that there may be a different way to address different types of uses in, in, the, in that context. Did you want to say something quickly about that? or? Um, it, it just may, be, it may, may mean that things that are... Um, you know, exempt type activities, and I'm not talking about gift shops, I'm talking about, you know, collections of um, content made available to other nonprofits for scholarship. Um, that might be one mandate, one type of remedy versus, um, you know, some type of activity that, um, you know, is seemingly more commercial, um, you know, benefiting individuals, not for a nonprofit purpose, and that's not enrichment for individuals, would have another remedy. Mr. Slocum? Uh, I'll also have some more comments tomorrow on, uh, on remedies, because I think that's a very relevant aspect of you know, certain of these uses should, should, if they're permitted, be permitted with regard to certain uh, remedies being attached. Like, for instance, um, you know, my members uh, convey the copyright of their scripts to producers and, and are going to be paid residuals. Uh, royalties for the exploitation of that work. And if someone's going to take up a work that's orphaned later, a movie that's orphaned, let's say, and distribute it, they should be, they should have to make those beneficiaries of the copyright whole. Because in fact, that aspect of the copyright's not orphaned. It's owed to somebody who's identifiable, even, <coughs> even if the middle middleman's not, not found. Um, uh, so anyway, that, but that's a little bit more for tomorrow. I, I think the, on the question of different users or different sort of, I don't know, types of origination, like home movies or whatever. I mean, I think that home video, uh, Charlie Bit My Finger, has probably paid for the college of Charlie and his brother. And um, surely that family has the right to that. Well, that YouTube posting, it was a home movie that was just posted for a family. So it's very much like taking a photograph of your kids in the backyard and wanting to put it in a place where your family who's far away could see it. And yet it turns into a commercially valuable uh, thing. So I think it has to be. Uh, very carefully considered um, if, if there are going to be carve-outs for sort of personal uses, um, they could have commercial value to those creators. And it's a very, sort of very blurry line uh, where you end up with things that are, that are created um, with a little bit more of an intention to, uh, to, for commercial exploitation or by professionals, <coughs> professional creators who make their living from that, but they do sort of a pet project or a personal project. Uh, that they put up on the on the on the internet, perhaps, um, but it turns out to have value because of their talent or whatever. So I think that needs to be protected. It shouldn't be just sort of re released casually. Right. And so there are two different types of, I guess we'll call them personal for this the, for these purposes: personal creation and then personal use. And so I guess the personal the, the creation is your the Charlie bit my finger situation, and then the use would be. I get to make my own copies of my family photos or whatnot. But the other blurry aspect is what is publication, right? Because putting it on YouTube is publication, but it's, it's often just for personal, you know, to share with personal friends, but then it turns into a commercial use. Okay. Mr. Collier? Yeah, I wanted to uh, just build a little bit on what uh, Jody Griffin said a few minutes ago. 
uh, about how the voices of private users are kind of getting lost in the shuffle here. Uh, one of the things that Tulane University did in preparation for our reply comment was to analyze uh, the differences in the initial comments from the first round of initial comments uh, uh, between the, the reply comments and the initial comments that were submitted to this most recent reply request. Um, and we found actually that um, out of the, first of all, the initial comments for the first round, there were over 700 of them, an incredible number. And uh, for this most recent round, we only had 91. So that's an incredible drop off in the number of people who are participating in this discussion. And in particular, we found that uh, from the original uh, 700 plus comments, only around 10% of them were actually submitted by formally identified representatives of large interest groups. Uh, and the rest were largely submitted by private individuals who were speaking on behalf of their personal concerns. Um, but with the most recent set of 91, almost none of those was actually a private individual speaking on behalf. And in fact, those, those few people who did seem to speak as private individuals seem to be saying actually just uh, in support of another group. You know, I'm a, I'm a private graphic artist and I support the position of the Graphic Artists of America. So uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the private individuals who don't feel affiliated with any of the larger groups are simply no longer participating in this discussion. And at, we think at Tulane University, we thought that it was vital that we not lose sight of these people. And in particular, we were concerned about the idea of tailoring a, uh, any legislation towards particular users or uses, even if they're nonprofit groups, even if they're libraries, because that would have the effect of separating the institutions who serve people from the people themselves that they're supposed to be serving. Does anyone else have anything to say about that? I think that's a valid point that it's hard to get people who are individuals who are out there using orphan works or wanting to use orphan works to make a comment to the copyright office or try to come participate because a lot of times I think people don't even know what is an orphan work. They might have come across it in their day-to-day -day life and they didn't know it's an orphan work and they just kind of stopped using it or didn't mess with it because they didn't know what to do. Does anyone have anything else to say about that? Ms. Cox? Um, I, I mean, I guess I would just add to that that um, the Sean Bentley Orphan Works Act, I think when it finally came out, or you know, when it, for, uh, when it came out of the Senate, was extremely long, extremely detailed. It was like 20 pages long. And I don't know that that makes it, um, that, that level of detail and that length is um, a positive aspect for individual users, as, as Jody said, who sometimes um, aren't as savvy or don't have the resources to understand what all that means. Ms. Prescott and then Mr. Cohen. Um, speaking from a practitioner perspective, um, I can uh, verify that, you know, that this, the nature of the conversation today seems to bear out exactly what you found in, in, your, in your study. And um, I think that you can easily include the, in, with the individual very small institutions and that they're going to have exactly the same fears and exactly the same difficulty in really even understanding, and that doesn't, that's not meant to be insulting, but to have the resources to, to really understand the nature of the conversation, never mind the risk aversion to actually take action. And I think that that really um, is becoming more and more of a problem less, rather than less of one. Mr. Cohen? Yeah, um, you know, our site serves a, a lot of just individual users who are just out there on the web. I think Michael Carroll and Creative Commons as well, I think is another place that people go and look for that sort of stamp of approval. I think individuals are already super confused by fair use. Um, I think anything we add in here, if it's confusing a lot of lawyers, it's probably going to confuse the general public. And so I think. What happens in that case is that I think most people are actually, we, we talk, we've talked a lot about bad actors, but I actually think most people are good actors, and I think we should try to tailor any legislation toward them as well. People who are out there using a Creative Commons search engine or using the DPLA to find things where their rights are very clearly specified. And so what I think you can do here is at least provide us with the tools who are trying, trying to provide openly available material with clear rights assigned to it so that there aren't um, infringers who are just going to a Google search engine and finding an image and cutting and pasting it, but actually trying to find a place that has the correct metadata and correct rights assigned to it. I think it has to be done at that level to at least be able to enable clearing houses in other places where it just it's clear for the average user who doesn't have to go through a mental calculation of multiple variables to figure out exactly what they're doing with this material. 
And that raises a question. I will call on Mr. Carroll in one second. Maybe you can address this as well, which is that it brings up the treatment of different users, not just in whether they should be covered, but, <clears throat> for example, the threshold of the reasonably diligent church. Would it be good to have different types of reasonably diligent churches for different classes of users, or is that just going to cause more confusion for people? And how is that going to work? And I'll turn to Mr. Carroll. Well, so I, I wanted to follow up on Mr. Cohen's point, which is um, uh, I, I do think that trying to solve the problem after it's occurred um, is, is going to be very difficult, which is why the registry discussion that w was taking place earlier may be a better way to address the needs of, of, of smaller uh, users, is, is making it incredibly easy to register your work and be found and, and, and be identified. Um, and so putting some more energy and effort into that. And then maybe having some consequences to the rights owner who doesn't, even after we've used digital technology to, to make it incredibly easy to push a button and license your, or I'm sorry, identify your work and register your work, um, the choice not to do that might have consequences. So other, we borrowed from patent law before. Other, other countries' patent systems have what's called a working requirement. If you have an invention and you have a patent right, but you don't actually commercialize the invention, then uh, the rights to do so can, can uh, be given to someone else. So I might limit the proposal only to published works, because I think what the orphans we're talking about are published works whose rights, whose owners can no longer be found. But where you've done that, where there's an easy opportunity to register and identify yourself and hold your hand up, and you haven't done any of those things, then, uh, then uh, privileging the use in those circumstances would be appropriate. Mr. Adler? I, I just wanted to comment on this view that uh, somehow this is all becoming way too complicated for individuals who, are, who would like to pursue um, use of orphan works. It probably is, like many other things in society, and that's another reason why you need to have the involvement of commercial interests in this, because you can't depend upon individuals who want to pursue the ability to use a particular work necessarily if they're not going to have the time, the resources, or, or the knowledge or sophistication to do it under uh, a scheme uh, that would be fairly sophisticated and complicated. But of course, that's what happens in society all the time, where commercial, in, uh, commercial interests grow around the need to provide certain services that the public wants. In many instances, those services here can range from whether or not there will be commercial search services, to commercial databases, to just simply the fact of people being able to say that they have heard about a work and ask a commercial service to be able not only to track it down, but to be able to clear whether or not it can be used as an orphan work. I think the mistake that, that, that we should avoid making here is that we're talking necessarily about whether people, especially individuals, uh, think that they're going to be using an orphan work scheme to allow them to necessarily use a work for free without charge. In, in, in society today, in many areas, people are willing to pay for value. If that value means that they get to use something that they otherwise would not be able to get to use, and they can do so for a reasonable price through commercial uh, interest providing that service to them, that's part and parcel of this picture. Ms. Griffin? Um, I think I, I agree that there are benefits from commercial entities coming up that can provide services to users. Um, but I think that when we're talking about new legislation, we don't want to create legislation that unnecessarily creates the need for those intermediaries. And to the extent that we can make the law as easy to use and as understandable as possible for individuals, that's the ideal solution. Okay. And I wonder if there are any types of uses that we haven't already talked about today that are ones that are most of concern to people around the table. There are certain things, obviously we've talked about library uses and individual uses. We've talked a little bit about the commercial uses as well, but if there are works or types of uses that people want to discuss that maybe have not been talked about but so much, and also from the writer's community and the author's community to see if there are ones that are particularly concerned about. Ms. Goodyear? Well, an, an obvious use um, for, member, for certain members of the College Art Association might be the use of an orphan work um, in, as, as an appropriated image in a work of art, in a work of fine art. Um, I mean, this, this then, of course, would shade into the question of whether it's, it's a fair use. And we acknowledge, um, as we uh, mentioned earlier, that, that we do not necessarily see 
an interest in orphan works legislation as being incompatible with the use, you know, with the with the fair use. Um, but obviously, um, fine artists like scholars uh, do seek to make use of visual imagery of all stripes, and much of what um, uh, can be located uh, may not. Um, have a rights owner readily um, associated with it, and as I say, may actually be an orphan or may be perceived to be an orphan. Um, and we recognize that if something is um, uh, perhaps mistakenly believed to be orphaned and a rights owner comes forward after the individual using that work has performed um, due diligence, that there may be a limited um, scope of remedies available to the infringed rights holder. Okay. Anyone else have any specific uses they wanted to talk about? I think we could take a little bit of time if anyone wanted to talk about the remedy situation that we're going to, we will be talking about tomorrow, but I think we're going to be talking about so many different topics with the remedies. If anyone has something they specifically want to talk about commercial versus non-commercial now. This would be a good time. Okay, Mr. Adler and then well, Mr. Slocum. I, I would just mention that one of the issues that had come up um, that was uh, addressed in the Senate bill was the problem that you have, and this, this is one of the difficulties of distinguishing commercial versus nonprofit, was the fact that many nonprofit institutions of the kind uh, that some people think should be sort of the focus of this scheme ultimately are state entities. Um, and due to a, a decision by the Supreme Court uh, and some uh, lower appellate courts, um, now state entities have what, what I think most uh, people who work in copyright-based uh, production of works would consider to be a very unfair uh, advantage of not being sued for damages uh, unless they consent to be sued for damages, uh, even when they engage in the most blatant kind of, of infringement. And one of the things that, that is a concern here is that if, in fact, we are still talking about a trade-off between a reasonably diligent search and limitation of remedies, the limitation of remedies for such entities is skewed then because they're not subject to being sued for damages anyway. So they're not, it's not as if they get any particular benefit or they need to follow the scheme in order to be able to avoid statutory damages should a copyright owner subsequently emerge. So for them, the issue was the question of uh, how do you deal with injunctive relief in, in an instance where somebody isn't subject to being sued for damages. And that had to be addressed in this issue in, in the legislation. And I think that will be an issue that would have to be revisited again as well. There was also a provision in the legislation that addressed the question uh, about um, the use of orphan works uh, to create compilations, essentially. Again, this was what I was saying about uh, the spectrum of uses range from whether you take an orphan work and use it to create a new work of original expression, one that is in itself copyrightable, uh, or whether you simply use the work in the condition in which you found it um, and you benefit society by making it available to society again so that they can have whatever benefit that work provides. But there's also the question of whether or not if you were to produce a compilation of those kinds of works, that would be entitled to copyright protection in its own right under a scheme like this. So there are many of these kinds of technical questions, which is why, unfortunately, it's almost, it's really difficult to think of any way of addressing orphan works that isn't going to be highly complicated and legally technical. And I guess the same thing could be said for derivative works, so yeah. what happens with those as well. Mr. Slocum? And, and I think that the, the, what's becoming clear is that the, the type of use that is involved uh, is going to be tied up with um, what type of remedy is associated with that. Because it's one thing to say that uh, someone should be able to take a clip of a film and put it into another film, um, and maybe they can't find the owner of the original to get it actually cleared. Um, it's another thing to say that they can actually distribute that movie, that other movie, uh, from which the clip came, and actually publish it. Um, and uh, as I alluded to, uh, often the right to remuneration, not established in law, but is established as a practice uh, in our industry by contract, um, is, is, is something that should be fulfilled uh, just because the publisher or studio is, is not locatable. It doesn't mean that the actual creators with an interest in that work are not locatable. And that also gets to the third-party registries or the, the nature of the diligent search. 
because there are entities like our guild which have a lot of information about who these entities are. We know who hired the original writer to buy the script from them. We know who their legal agent for service is. We know if there's a successor to them that's filed a document with us to take over the rights and the obligations. Uh, we even we know who the heirs are to the actual human author, um, so that we can, you know, convey the royalties to the to the family. So there are entities out there that are specialized that will have a lot of information about the obligations that are attached to a work, and uh, who the various rights holders or beneficiaries of copyright are. But it's going to be, I think, very highly related to what uses you're talking about. Um, Ms. Covens and then Ms. Cox. At, at the risk of conflating parts of the Copyright Act, I also wonder if there are any lessons that can be drawn from the termination provisions, because both instances involve activity taking place, assuming one is using an orphan work, and a rights holder appearing on the scene, saying, wait, I want to change the, the, you know, the, the framework here. And um, you know, th there are some interesting lessons about remedies and how content is handled when it is in the midst of being used and a rights holder appears on the scene. Ms. Cox and then Mr. Carroll. Yeah, just on the point on, on remedies, um, I think this was brought up this morning by, by Kyle and also by Jonathan Band in the first panel, um, something that, that we think could actually be a very simple solution to the, to the Orphan Works problem rather than having this 20 page, you know, Sean Bentley Orphan Works Act is to just make a small amendment to section 504 and to um, just say that courts should give courts the discretion to remit or reduce statutory damages, provided that the infringer shows that he made a reason reasonably diligent search and was unable, um, in good faith, and, and was unable to find the right holder. We think that that solves um, some of the problems of, of you know, not needing to, def to define with specificity what a reasonable, reasonably diligent search is, because um, you're not ordering the court to remit damages, you're just giving them the discretion to do so, and they can take into account factors um, of, of what the best practices are, what, stan what standards um, are, are being used in the community to, to uh, address reasonably diligent searches. And that um, gives courts the flexibility to adapt to um, changing standards, evolving standards in light of new technologies or um, new ways of, of performing these searches. Following up on that a little, I, I think def focusing on the problem that needs solving, uh, what, and this goes to the earlier conversations about orphan works versus digitization efforts and, and the extent to which those two belong in the same um, conversation. So with respect to remedies, uh, in the case of the orphan that is cur currently needs reformatting from analog to digital, someone has to invest in that reformatting. And, and what I would hate to see is a remedies provision that undermines the incentive to create that digitization, the value of the di digitization in the first place. So um, I, I think it ought to be, uh, if there's gonna be some um, acknowledgement about that sunk capital basically, which can then be captured by a rights owner who emerges after the fact, um, after somebody's digitized and then used. And so um, accounting for the value that was invested in the digitization ought to be part of the scheme if there's going to be a finely tailored um, uh, remedies provision. Otherwise, uh, the uh, amendment to F Section 504 seems like a more elegant way to deal with this. Okay, if no one else from the panel, oh, Mr. Adler. Well, just since, since we're sort of repeating this discussion, but um, if you're going to take that approach, you still need to inform the court with to some degree uh, with, with objectivity and for purposes of uniform and consistent interpretation, what is meant by a reasonably diligent search. And if you're not going to do it through legislation, you would have to do it through regulation. You would have to do it some way. Simply to say to a federal court, uh, Your Honor, you go out and find all of these best practice statements and you decide which of them make sense uh, in each of these areas. That's, that's no way in which to provide for uh, an even-handed way in which uh, orphan works policy can be administered. Mr. Courtney? I sort of agree, but best practices are used in a lot of other areas of law. Um, they can be used in, for good, or, okay, all right, I'll agree with that, for good or bad, but they, you know, they are adopted, so malpractice. What would a lawyer do in your situation that was faced with the same case? Medical malpractice. How would a doctor, in a country doctor versus a city doctor? And they kind of, you know, use best practices. Additionally, 
I think the UCC is just a best practice document that has been codified and it's gone through that cycle of being codified. Um, and I think that's important too. I think best practices can lead to coherent uh, rules, if you will, uh, aspirational goals. Uh, Society of American Archives has had a best practices for orphan work since 2009. There's been no litigation regarding that and they seem to be following it. Um, so I, I think you can inform the decision. It's not the end all be all, I agree. Uh, one judge and one jury member can mess that all up. Absolutely, I agree. Um, but I think it, it can be a start. Well, thank you. And I think at this point, we have time for a few questions from the audience if we wanted to do that. So we're going to bring out the microphones and see if anyone has additional questions. Uh, my name is Ariel Katz from the University of Toronto. Um, I just want to add a few words for the distinction between fair use and orphan work solution. I can see a possibility that there also may be a temporal line in the sense that, okay, things, activities that you have done before the owner emerges and then you couldn't contact, there is a clear market failure, you couldn't get permission because there was no one to get permission for, there, might be, there ought to be greater leniency there. But once the owner shows up and say, thank you very much for reusing my work and telling me what great potential it is, but now, I want to get part of it. Now, there is an owner with whom you can negotiate. And then there may be a difference between how the work or your use is being treated from that point onward. Now, there may be a difference between type of uses, right? So if the work is being incorporated in a book, right? It's image in a book or incorporated in a movie. It's already there. You can't take it out. Okay, and then the remedy should take that into account. But if what you do is uh, like Amazon, just print on demand off the entire book, and the owner shows up and says, look, I'm the owner. Stop doing that unless you pay me. And you can stop. There's no, there doesn't take out. You can, you can easily stop. Then you should, I think, have the, the full range of remedies from that moment onward. Thank you. That's we have another audience member. And Anne Hoffman from the National Writers Union. Um, I just want to take a minute on this best practices. Um, you say there have been best practices for archivists since 2009. I think so. I don't think that's a big deal. I think that's pretty, you know, um, contemporary and hasn't borne the test of time. I think to compare that to standards for malpractice, which have been around for centuries for better or worse, is absolutely nonsensical. And in this room today, we've heard about probably eight or 10 different codes of best practices that have been developed by somebody. I don't know if any author knows about the best practices in the industries affecting them. And so I, I think we're putting the cart ahead of the horse um, I think the, the creator of a work ought to have the rights that copyright bestows on him or her. And the person who wants to use that work without permission oughtn't to be able to hide behind anything um, at, at this point. You want to respond, Mr. Well, they're not So they don't hide behind fair use. They have that as an actual right. Um, and what we're, you know, that's, they can use a portion of a copyrighted work without permission. That's a, and it's in the law, absolutely. As far as best practices, uh, they have been around for hundreds of years. I agree. Um, but we have to start somewhere. So just because 2009 isn't 1950 doesn't mean that we should discount them. We should allow them to develop in these fields. And additionally, if these artists or copyright holders should be paid for this, absolutely, I agree. They should be paid for their work when uses are outside the scope of fair use or some other transformative fair use. The problem is they're not registered. We can't find them, because we're talking about orphan works. I would never you know, try and I encourage someone to take someone else's work without permission if they clearly are registered, findable, either through any of the stuff that we've talked about here, whether it's databases that are private or public, or the copyright records. I think there's a, there's a diverse array of ability for us to search for this. Um, and I think libraries have that special role uh, because Congress thinks we're special. We have 108. We have uh, 
We have 50C2. We have lots of things that make us information professionals, and we want to help with this. But there are some areas we just can't help in, and Orphan Works is one of those because we have no idea where to find these folks. Except that we've heard today of various organizations that identified Orphan Works, which were not orphaned at all, and a very simple search turned up that fact. So I think um, we're sort of trying to deal with a problem that is more in the heads of the users sure. than in truth. I think with that, um, it's the end of our session. And so for, thank you very much for all of our participants and our audience members. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.